You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila. Handcrafted, expert approved, with over 20 international blind tasting awards. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York, 40% alcohol by volume. Drink responsibly. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, a man on a never-ending search for the perfect pizza. This show is the audio version of the Pizza Talk YouTube series, where I engage in interesting conversations with some of the country's greatest pizza makers and other artisans. Thanks for joining me on this quest. Welcome to Pizza Quest with Peter Reinhardt, and I'm Peter Reinhardt. Here is my longtime friend, Michael Calanti, who's joining us today from San Francisco. Michael and I go back, we do go back a long way, both to our days working together at the California Culinary Academy, but we even predate that Before we knew each other, we have something else in common, which is a very strong bond for anybody from Philadelphia. We're both from the Philadelphia area, and uh, and so we've got a lot of common bonds. So we're going to talk about all of that today, and especially what I'm excited about. And by the way, welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. I want to hear about this new project that you're working on, developing uh, a new kind of a bread, a pizza-style bread for one of our favorite places, uh, Delfina, and Pizzeria Delfina in San Francisco, uh, and I had a chance to visit with you recently, you know, at Delfina and taste your new bread. And we said, we've got to get an episode of Pizza Quest to talk about this. But we're going to come back to that after we kind of bring everybody else up to date. Some of our viewers will know you from the Bread Symposium, where you made a great presentation a few months ago, uh, you know, on uh, what, what was the your topic was, was it uh, Pre- prebiotics, prebiotics, prebiotic, right. uh, yeah. fibers for digestive health and how to get that into your pizzas and into your breads. Right. And uh and, you know, back when we first met in person, you were at the California Culinary Academy. You were department chair there. You actually were the one who hired me. You signed, I think you're the one who signed me up to teach there, where, I, where we worked together for about five years. Uh, and then, and you were a pastry chef then. And and I, so there has to have been a life before that that led up to you becoming a pastry chef. So I want to hear a little bit about your own journey, you know, both, I think you were trained in France, if I'm not mistaken, and and how you kind of became a pastry chef. and You were teaching pastry. And then when I left California Culinary Academy to go to Johnson & Wales, you took over the bread class that I was teaching and suddenly went from pastry to bread. We kind of pulled you over from from the... Well, from from the the pastry to, side to the, to the dark bread. side, yeah, we got you over side, to, yes. to fermentation to the fermentation side. So we want to hear all about that that whole journey. But, but why don't you take us back a little bit and just uh, you know how it all started and happened for you? Well, thanks, thanks, Peter. And you know, back to you know, you just as an aside said, I'm the one that hired you. I have to say that is one of the smartest things I have ever done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> because when you did leave, you had you had instilled in me enough of love for uh, fermentation and yeast that it began my own bread and pizza quest, and I've been on that now for two and a half decades. So and who knew? Who knew back then for either of us that fermentation and bread were going to become such a big thing when you brought me on at the school. The bread program at the California Culinary Academy consisted of a couple of things out of the Gieselin book on how to make a basic fast fermentation baguette and a few soft rolls and things like that. It was all basic stuff. And then we, you know, uh, pioneered there bringing in the long, you know, artisan techniques, the long fermentation and all that, that was just getting started then. And, but none of us, I think, had a clue that it was going to explode and be such a, a paradigm changer for, for the whole, you know, baking community. You're, you're exactly right. And that, you know what I'll tell, I always tell my students to this very day, if you love it, you just have to do it because it, it will take you places. Once you put your soul and your heart into it, then it just takes care of you. 
Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it did. So, 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 but when I, before I met you, you were already a pastry chef. I already knew you actually from videos that I had seen on TV of you cooking at the Academy. There were these, these cooking uh, programs that you did, did for them and you were making things. You, you had a technique when you were teaching your students how to roll out laminated doughs that I still use to this day. I still quote you 20, what is it now? 30 years later, almost. Uh, and, and Cause I remember it was like, it was one of those instructions that kind of stuck with me, which was when you roll out your dough, always move from the center to the corners, roll from the center to the corners, center to the corners. And that became almost a mantra for me when I was teaching my students on how to roll out their, their uh, croissant doughs and Danish doughs and things like that. Wow. You, you're taking me back because uh, that actually I learned from my French mentor. Wow. Um, who uh, had a pastry shop. He used to run, his name was uh, Pierre, and he used to run the um, the La Notre production shop wow. in uh, Provence. So <laughs> he made pastries and breads and everything. And, and he got out of that business and wanted to establish his own pastry shop just north of Paris a little bit. Uh-huh. And when he moved into town, he, he put terror into all the other bakers and everything and so he had to make a deal with them that he would not make bread he would only make pastries wow and wow. um and then so and i was uh, i was the beneficiary of that because during the day of course i was his pastry apprentice but then after everything was said and done he would say all right now let me teach you how to bake so i started to get i was very clumsy with it but i started to understand uh fermentation wow i had no idea what is it about french chefs and pastry chefs that that they they rule by terror. They are the most frightening people in the world. <laughs> is it something that they that there's a program for how to become like? No, I, you know what? That was a poor choice of words on my part. Um, but, but that's really, been my experience as well. I mean, this this sense of intimidation is like. Well, I, I it, it it wasn't that when I was talking about Pierre, it was that he was so well known. I mean, talk about somebody who's who's uh, uh, you know reputation precedes them. Here he was in the south of France, and his reputation went all the way up to Normandy. And when he moved into this little town, I mean, you know, it's it's like you're like, okay, what's going to happen here? So that was really the the sense of terror I was uh, well, talking I, about. I, I think it's, 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 it comes with the package. <laughs> well, I must say, uh, I, I, when I met him, I, I actually was doing a, um, a stage in the kitchen in Paris. I thought I wanted to be a chef. And um, it was it was grueling. It was hot. It was just, it was really, I mean, it was like, you know, Anthony Bourdain, Kitchen Confidential, kind of, yeah. it was like all of that stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I was just not ready for that. So yeah. uh, there was a, a pastry chef. He used to come in. This was Pierre. He would come in once or twice a week because the restaurant didn't have enough space for its own pastries. And he would assemble out in the alley behind the restaurant. He wow. would bring his flat his flatbed truck down and with his work tables on it and refrigerated things, he would wipe it all down and he would put together moose cakes and very simple things. I used to hang out in the alley with him and he was six foot eight. If he was, if he was an inch. Wow. And, uh, but his touch, I mean, he could touch pastry dough and it would just do what he said. Wow. And um, that that's where I said, you know, it's like, teach me how to do this. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it was like the pastry whisperer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Be, well before that phrase even existed. Yes. But uh, so I went and worked with him and uh, learned the basics of pastry, not so much bread at this point, and came back to Philadelphia and was hired by a school there. I'm sure you remember called the Restaurant School. The restaurant School in Philadelphia, yeah. And they had a culinary program, but they did not have a baking and pastry program. So they enlisted me and they said, hey, why don't you te- you know, build this for us? 
in uh, undergrad, I had a lot of experience in education, and I had some connections uh, at DuPont Circle in Washington with the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the government and how they uh, lend money to students and all that kind of stuff. Wow. So I had that connection. And so I, uh, I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll build you a baking and pastry program. So uh, I learned how to do that. I went back to France a couple times to actually like, okay, teach me these techniques, teach me that. Yeah, that's great. Flesh, that's great uh, that you could do that, and then you had the connections over there to do that. It, w- it was great, but you know what? And and this is how this is how pastry chefs and bakers are, and you know that. Uh, you know, we're very forthcoming with things, mm-hmm. and I was able to go to some of the biggest names in Philadelphia, like Gunther Highland at the, oh, yeah. uh, at, uh, the, the legendary Hotel Gunther and everything. Yeah. And these are our master chefs and say, you know, teach me how to make, you know, a Dobosh tort. And yeah. so I, I, I really got a lot of field training in that regard. So you're, uh, you're so fortunate. And, uh, and, and like you say, so many of the baking and pastry masters were very generous with their knowledge. Uh, you and I also got to work with a guy who wasn't quite as generous in, in San Francisco. Uh, uh, if you recall, uh, a guy named Bo, who 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 used to used to teach. Do you remember this? He used to teach his students uh, at the at the at the academy uh, uh, all, up to a certain point, and then he would do like the most important step, and he would turn his back, and the students couldn't see around his, around them to see what was the final step that he did. That he would always keep one little secret from them. Do you remember that? <laughs> I, you know, I have to say, I don't, I don't know that particular, I don't know that particular characteristic. Well, he but was, I did, he but was I a legendary uh, instructor because he wrote this beautiful cookbook, uh, uh, The Art of, you know, uh, Pastry, uh, Bo Freeberg. And Bo was, you know, was legendary. But that was the one thing that everybody who I know who worked with Bo all said, did he do this to you too? He turned his back at the last minute and not show you that last little, little technique. <laughs> It was well, I, I have to say, I, 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 I never experienced that, <laughs> but, um, but I, but I, I do, I mean, my, my feeling really for the people that I've got to work with in this industry, in, in so many different countries, in France, in Italy, in Brazil, and just wherever I went, bakers and pastry chefs always just seem like, Oh, come on in because we'll show you how to do this. And I think the thing, especially with bakers, with dough, with pizza, is that, you know, it's so subjective to the environment that it's in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you come and take a class with me in San Francisco where our water is this pH and our ambient temperature is always this, et cetera, I can show you things. But you have to go home. You have to take that to your environment and pretty darn quickly you have to start trying to replicate it or it's just going to fade from your memory so i i i really i mean i've encouraged that in my students i encourage that with uh my clients they're always saying to me well you're so giving with your with your information i'm like well you know it's uh, (laughs) you have to learn how to do it yeah, so I, I'm happy to show you because, as you know, this is our this is our tradition. This goes back decades. This goes back centuries. This goes back millennia. Yes, and you know we have this gift for uh, the period of time that we that we have it, and really we only own it for a short time, and then we have to give it to the next. Pass it on. Yeah, we. Once we become educators, and this is one of the things that, you know, when we were at the academy together, we used to talk about a lot was the notion that there's a difference between being a professional chef or pastry chef and being a, a chef educator, you know, a chef instructor. And, and one of the major differences is, is that once you become an instructor, it's really all about passing it on, being a Sherpa for your students and, and getting them to the mountaintop. And it's not about you anymore. It's about it's about their success. Yeah, and those fifty-pound bags of flour, you know that yeah. that sherpas your back right out. So you got you know, it. Well, <laughs> I want to fast forward you now. a little bit uh, because what we 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 were there at the academy. You were teaching on the pastry shot. I was on the bread uh, in a different classroom with the breads, and then um, and then somehow you know I moved on to uh, the moved to the east coast, and and you 
uh, transitioned over into the bread side. And suddenly you were writing bread books. Then, you know, I had done a couple of books. You were now writing books and, and furthering the curriculum on bread making at the Academy. And you stayed at the Academy for quite a number of years, you know, after I left, while you were doing your own books, doing product development for other companies, you had a lot of things going uh, along the way. Yeah. Very, uh, you know, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of juggling. Um, you know, you make it all sound very seamless. And of course it wasn't <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it we wasn't wish. like that at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, but, but I think the, the real thing was, you know, you inspired me with just watching you make bread and seeing the products that, that you could make in the kitchen and watching the students' faces light up. And when you left and uh, the school came to me, and because at the time I was the education director, and they said, hey, you know what? First of all, fill in this gap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where Peter was. And then why don't you make this out into a big program instead of just a short little little segment? So uh, if you remember Curtis Bagley. I was just thinking in, of Curtis when you said that. And, yeah. and he actually was uh, uh, in that lineage of yes. the California Culinary Academy. He was kind of like in between you and me in that class. I think he carried yes. for a while. Yeah. And he's down in uh, Florida now with wow. his own shop. So, no kidding. So, Good to know that. He was a great baker. Yeah. So, yes. And uh, so, so he actually was my, I think, front of house guy while I was in the back flushing out the uh the curriculum and putting more things into it and wow. i'll tell you what this again this is where mm -hmm. i have to thank the bread baking community because i thought all right well listen let's let's have some artisan breads you know that's a big this was very hot let's get that in here and so i went to craig ponsford who at the time had a bakery called the Artisan Bake Shop. And I was yeah, like, okay, Sonoma, well, here's the I'm yeah. going to go here. Yeah. And, I, and I said, hey, Craig, you know, I have to write this program. Teach me how to do these things. And he, you know, he was like, okay, come on in, come on in. Here's well, how the great thing about Hot Craig was, was that he was a graduate of the California Color and Academy. So he was one of your alums. So he was very much in, you know, into that. And, and as you know, he's a consummate uh, instructor as well. Yeah. So, um, so, so I would learn things from him. I would go to Curtis and I would say, Hey, Curtis here, uh, let's build this in. Let's do that. And Curtis would say, all right, I can do this because he had the logistics of how bread works within a, you know, five hour class and things like that. Yeah. And, um, and then, of and course, then, the, and then, go ahead. I was going to say, then the Bread Bakers Guild of America came into existence around that same time as well. So we were all able to tap into a deeper well of knowledge from the masters, the European masters that came over to this side. Well, you know, and especially I, I have to also say Steve Sullivan from Acme Bread. Right. He he opened his doors to me literally and said, here, come and work on the bench. Learn how we do this. Watch yeah. how this. See how important scaling is, et cetera. That was so very generous of him. I was able to bring those, those those industry competencies into the program, which mm -hmm. really and and Curtis was able to interpret that, and and so you know in that way, I was really kind of the facilitator between what the industry really needs in, yeah. in baking graduates and what the program at the school taught them. That's amazing. That's, that's fantastic. Um, well, uh, be, before we run out of time in this segment, I'll just say a couple of other things that will lead us into part two when we, when we come back. And yes. that is uh, that while we were there, another thing that you and I both kind of got a chance to do while we were at the Academy and you continue to do it uh, is to work on product development for companies that specialized in creating new products for the industry. For the So, so we used to get to work on these, uh, these prototypes. We would create prototypes for major companies uh, which we're probably not allowed to even talk about, you know, on the air, but the, the big, the big food producing companies. And sometimes we would all go to these presentations. We'd each work on four or five prototypes and, and present them ideas that wasn't our job to figure out how to mass produce them. It was our job to inspire the company with something they should be thinking about five years from now or 
right? And so let's, let's just touch on that for a couple of seconds, and then we'll use that as a springboard to move into uh, in part two to talk about what the new the new development that you're doing. Great, that's great. So that uh, that that company that we work for, it's still going strong. Uh, is CCD <laughs> Innovation, the Center for Culinary Development. Exactly. Yes, and they would take. Uh, big name clients. And you're right, we have NDA, so we can't say who we work for. But I do tell, I do explain it to people and say, you know what, walk down the bakery aisle and walk down the snack bar aisle and walk down the cereal aisle in your grocery store. And those are the people that we would do projects for. Right. And, um, you know, it was like you said, you know, they, they, they take consumer reports, they take trend forecasting, and then they reach out to a number of, of uh, chefs on their council. And you and I got to work on a couple of projects together because yeah. we both have the baking uh, expertise. And we would come to a meeting and say, all right, you want uh, you want uh, low gluten uh, cookies that hit the sweet spot for afternoon snacking, et cetera. And then I would have four or five. Uh, actually, they were they were called protoceps at that point because it's a concept that yeah. we make into a shape. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and the uh, and then the the company in the room. You would have the uh, the marketing people, you'd have the financial people, you have the manufacturing people, and then you have like, you know, their chefs. And right. they would listen to about 20 or 25 presentations over the course of the day of different products. And then they go back and then they ruminate on all of that. And they come out with, with a product and they say, you know what, we like, we like the shape that Peter's cracker had we like that shape but you know michael's flavor profile was really good and how about you know shelly put this particular and so they would put <laughs> things together and come up with something and uh it's it was amazing because uh, you know it, gave, it was one of the first chances i had to see at that scale the scale of the food industry yes. um you know how much they would spend they would spend you know the, hire the ccd to put together a panel of five chefs like us to make each of us five presentations and how much it cost them to do that. And if they, and if they came out of that process with one or two usable ideas, exactly. they were happy. And yeah. I'm going, Holy cow. And it was yeah. nice for us to get paid, to be creative and to get, and, and, and not that, that to figure it all out, but to just be creative and sort of like, you know, open the floodgates and just see what comes out. It, yeah. And, and, you know, part of that whole thing was for me, learning to uh, create and then let it go yeah. and say, you know, I, you know, I would make a cookie and of course it, it was the best cookie in the whole entire world. And no, <laughs> yeah. no cookie was better, not even yours. Right. Right. And the, you know, they would say, Oh, I like this little piece from it or something. So in the end it was, it was like, you know, you go to the Louvre and you see the Mona Lisa and you say, you know what? I I was the one that told them to put her hand inside her her cloak like that. That was that was what I said, and people are like, oh, "Okay, good, right, so, right, right." Uh, I'll share my favorite moment from one of those uh, situations. Um, we had another colleague of ours from the academy, Greg Tompkins, was also yes. on on that panel. Yes. And and one day he and I made got to do a joint presentation of some products that we had worked on, and uh, and and. Um, I did mine and then he did his and we would alternate back and forth. And so he he did one of his and uh, it was a real interesting product. I can't even remember what it was. It was a baked good of some sort. And the team from the company, you know, as one of the, the guys said to Greg, he said, Greg, it's really interesting, but what, instead of baking it at 400, like you said, what if we baked it at 450 or 475, what would happen? And Greg looked at him and without blinking an eye, he said, well, you would probably volatize the aromasticity. And they all started nodding like this. And a couple minutes later, he and I walked out of the room together and I kind of whispered to him and I said, volatize the aromasticity. Where did you come up with that? He says, well, I just pulled it out of my butt. He said, he said, I have no idea what it means, but they love hearing talk like that. And I said, now I understand how this works. Guess what though? Guess what? And we can talk about sensory science. That's actually true. 
I yeah. don't know that the words are right, but the concept is true. Which, which is going to lead us into, uh, uh, in part two, when we come back, I want to start by talking about uh, the next, one of the other steps in your evolution as a chef, which is to become a master taster. So we want to hear about what that's about and how that becoming a master taster and all this other background has led to you now doing new product development for other companies. So let's let's uh, uh, come back after a short break. I'm with Michael Calanti, who's coming to us from San Francisco. Uh, I'm Peter Reinhardt. This is Pizza Quest. Come back for part two, and we'll continue this great conversation with Mike. We'll be right back with more Pizza Quest right after this break. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods at a family-owned and operated distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. 818 is created from fully matured blue agave from the Los Altos and Valles regions of tequila. It is then slow cooked for over 30 hours, extracted using traditional Tahona wheels, distilled twice in copper pot stills, and aged in American and French oak barrels. This process creates the best tasting, highest quality tequila possible. Their tequilas have received over 20 blind tasting awards. They strive for excellence in every sip. 818's Blanco is sweet and smooth with undertones of tropical and citrus fruits. Their Reposado is soft and balanced with notes of caramel and vanilla. Their Añejo is elegant and velvety with crisp herbal notes and a warm vanilla finish. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their tequila and find it near you. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York, 40% alcohol by volume. Drink responsibly. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Well, welcome back to part two of Pizza Talk and Pizza, we call it Pizza Talk, but really it's Pizza Quest. We changed the name a couple of times uh, for a a year or two during the pandemic. We were calling the show Pizza Talk because we were focusing on pizzerias that were figuring out how to pivot during this unusual, amazing, crazy time that we've all been through. But we've had a chance to explore that. And so we've gone back to, I think, you know, the the original vision of Pizza Quest, which is, is not only to explore the journey of pizza, but you know the journey of self-discovery through pizza. And today we're with Michael Calanti, who you see here as avatar is on the screen right now. The product developer, Michael Calanti, who's been talking to us about some of his uh, the work leading up to what we're about to get into, which is which is some new product development. And and, and so there is Mike. And and Mike, before we took the break, uh, I'm going to uh, let you just talk over this image and then take us through some of the slides you have. Um, you you know, uh, after becoming a pastry chef, became a bread instructor, started writing books about bread. Uh, And then uh, in more recent times, you became a certified master taster, which is something that most people don't know exists. And everybody's going to want to know, like, 
how can I become a master taster as well? We all we all think we're great tasters, but you there's a science to all this. Can you tell us a little bit about about what it be, what it took to become a master taster, and then how you use all of that and bring it all together? You know, through bringing science and and taste and everything together to start to continue your product development work. Sure. Oh, that's great. You know, you you said how do I how do I become a, a master taster? You know, uh, I, and my my answer is. Well, you know, you see that line over there? You got to get in that line. Do a lot right. of tasting. Yeah. So many people are like, hey, I just want I just want to taste stuff and tell you about it. So, um, but uh, okay, so so the uh um and 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 this was a a spin-off from my uh product development work with uh CCD that you and I were on and uh I connected with a company they're called Chef's Best. And they are an independent uh, judging uh, firm. And what we have is a a panel of master tasters and we evaluate consumer products, everything from cereal to uh, soy milk alternatives to gluten-free cookies, anything that you're going to see in a grocery store shelf, we put it through a test and we have master tasters who evaluate it. So. I right now am a uh, moderator, a, pan- a panel mo- moderator for, yeah. for this group. Uh, but prior to that, for about mm, 10 or 15 years, I was actually on the panel itself as a master taster. Huh. And to become a master taster, jokingly, <laughs> you have to eat a lot of things. Yeah. But um, the the the... I think that the the real important thing here is to understand that I'm not a super taster. I I can't, you know, walk into a room and say, oh, someone baked a potato here in tinfoil four days ago because (laughs) that, you know, and there are super tasters and they can do that. I think that's important uh, to point out that you don't have to be a super taster to become a master taster. That's that's a pretty important piece of information. No, you you actually kind of don't want to be because it makes you uh, oversensitive or can Mm -hmm. make you oversensitive to uh, to certain uh, sensory attributes of a product. So if you took if you took the bell curve of how people can taste like with super tasters over here and people down here that can only taste five or six things, you, you, you actually kind of want to be somewhere in the center. You uh-huh. want to be where you're you're most like the the community. Uh-huh. But the trick is you have to learn to calibrate your palate and describe what it is that you are experiencing. Yeah. From aroma, from visuals, from texture, et cetera. And uh, I, I guess I kind of knew I had an interest in this from uh, childhood because I remember I you know, we used to go to the Jersey shore in the summer and there was a hotel there that had a, a big pool and it was a salt pool uh-huh. and uh, not a chlorine pool. And I remember one day coming out and telling my grandpa, I said, you know, I think they put too much salt in today. <laughs> and, uh, it, it just, it seems a little saltier, tastes saltier. And plus I float a little bit more. Wow. And, and he said, you know, okay, okay, little Mike, you know, <laughs> and uh, so I was like seven. <laughs> and he went that's the point where the grandpa cars. smacks you around a little bit and says, who do you think you are? <laughs> so he, he, he went over to the lifeguard, you know, because, you know, he's, he was very supportive. And he took me over and he that's said, cool. you know, my, my grandson said there, there is more stuff in here. And so they, they took out their little test and they said, you know what, there is actually two parts more per million of saline in this water than there was two days ago. And thus a master taster was born. <laughs> and, and I was like, see, I told you. And everybody was like, you know, no one else could tell the difference. <laughs> yeah, right. That's like, the, that's like the, the basketball player who looks at the basket and says that it's an eighth of an inch off, you know, and, and, they, <laughs> and they measure it and they say, he's right. <laughs> so, 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 
so first of all, you need to have that kind of like, you know, bent in order to, you know, be trained to be a master taster. But yeah. before you go through the training, they do qualification tests and they do these. There's a series of tests they do in the and the most interesting one I always like was what's called a triangle test. And they will take, for example, uh, um, they'll just take water. They'll just take tap water and they'll put. Uh, four parts per million of lemon juice in these two samples and then eight parts per million in this other sample. And they'll give you three samples and your challenge is to say which one is different. You don't have to say why. You just have to say this one particularly is different from these other two. And, um, you know, and and it's, it's pretty challenging. Yeah. So they look at your scores, they test you again, and then they'll take the folks that have good basic discrimination abilities. And then they'll invest in training you mm-hmm. and giving you, for example, oh, let's train people on uh, let's train people on sweetness, right? Mm-hmm. So here at this one level, we'll have just you know plain water and then we'll have peanut butter. And then we'll have canned soup and then we'll have jam. And they, they teach you how to eat one, each one of these things and put it on a scale and say, you know, it's not better than that. It's not worse than that. It's just this much higher uh-huh. than that. Uh-huh. And your ability to repeat that over yeah. different products is what makes you uh, is what makes you valuable as a human tasting machine. So, so the two words that come to mind when you describe all that is one is to, is to differentiate and discriminate and then to articulate, or so we'll say discrimination and articulation of, of the differences and, and giving you the language. So a lot of it is a language based skill as, as being able to create the imagery or language Im- uh, equivalencies to compare it. This is like that. Am I, am I, that, kind of that is, that? that is a very clear way of of explaining that story that i told yeah, really. yeah wow but it's but, <laughs> no, it's, but, it's, exactly but it's so it's right. a trainable skill if you've got the aptitude you need the aptitude and they will train you and then you will sit on a panel and you know it takes you about six months to a year really to come up to speed because you're in there with people who have been doing this. Yeah. And at the beginning, you say, well, I, I I think this is about an eight on the scale of sweetness. And everybody else looks at you and goes, no, dude, this is clearly a 14. And you're like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you have to go through your fair share of humiliation first to work your way. Well, to you, you have to, you have to learn. And, you know, it, it's not a concept that makes sense now because everything is digital. And when you get off the plane, your phone automatically resets to whatever time zone you're on. But there was a time where you used to get off the airplane and then you would have to reset your clock yeah. to match that. And that's the analogy that that yeah. clicks in my head because yeah. I'm old school that way. So but I love that because you just used an analogy and analogies are almost like the heart and soul of this particular skill set. So how do you how do you translate now you've got the designation as a master taster? Do you do you actually get paid to have to use that skill? Well, you sit on the panel for the uh for the chef's best sessions, and you yeah, you 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 get a, a fee for sitting down for having that degree of of uh of uh just reliability and professionalism. Yeah. And yeah. so you know, you you can get paid for sitting on those on those panels. Isn't it nice to get paid to be creative and to be able to use a skill that you know that that you've cultivated? Well, I'll tell you what. And, and, and that's why I, you know, I, I go back to something I said before that I tell my students, you know, if you, if, if it's your passion, if you love it, just do it, get better at it. And, you know, you'll be amazed at, at how people will reward you for that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the, the thing that the master's taster, the master tasters say to this very day, after the end of a three hour session, they say, wow, you know what? That was the easiest 
chef job I ever had because <laughs> you're sitting down the whole time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. And and you're getting paid for for your knowledge. Knowledge is power. Exactly. And I think that exactly. that's an important as 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 our students evolve in their careers, we want them to understand that at some point they want to be able to work with their head and not just their hands. And 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 that's where the knowledge comes in. Yes, absolutely. So, so let's 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 take that now and and apply it to a very specific new situation for you. This uh, we're looking at the slide where it says Roman Pizza Bread Project, Delfina Restaurant, San Francisco. Can you tell us a little bit about that and take us through this little slideshow? Sure, uh, Delfina Restaurant in uh, San Francisco. They set up shop, um, I think, about twenty eight years ago. Amazing, and uh, in their earlier years, actually. They won the James Beard Award, and uh, they were very forward in their cuisine. Uh, after a couple of years, they put in a uh, a pizzeria, which we started. featured on on Pizza Quest. Uh, in our very first year, we have some great video footage of of our visit at Pizzeria Delfina with with Craig Stoll, the owner, and Anthony yes. Strong, who was his pizzaiolo at the time. And so, so this is like for me a kind of a a flashback to 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and now coming full circle to the next iteration of what he's doing. Well, exactly. And and in the interim, they've been able to set up a couple other shops in San Francisco and then down in uh, the Silicon Valley. So um, pandemic forced all the restaurants to be closed and slowly they were able to like you know serve things through the window out onto the street etc and so uh craig at delfina said you know what this is a great time we're going to remodel this original restaurant and we're going to knock the wall out we're going to combine all the spaces together and we're going to reopen as a very authentic roman cuisine spot Wow. With pizzas and then other uh, Roman Roman items. And, and for those people who don't know, the, the original Pizzeria Delfina was right next door to the original Delfina. There were two separate spaces next door to each other. And on the on the other side of Pizzeria Delfina is the original Tartine Bakery. All of this all on one block, along with a couple of the great stores like Byright and like Byright, Byright, Byright. Exactly. And that one block, we did a whole series of episodes with them. We call that one block the Gastro. Uh, the the gastro district because there were so many great food places there and and so we visited both the Petria Delfina and Delfina but they were two separate restaurants and now you're saying he's going to make them into one kind of cohesive space knock the wall out you know brought in really I mean the 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 architects and the designers really it's it's really a beautiful space it's a you know, we're looking at, uh, we're looking, they're looking at a, a, a hard opening, uh, like the end of the summer, like August, beginning of September. And they have a soft opening right now where they serve a lot of takeout and then this, uh, this new Roman bread that. Uh, Which is what brings us to, to, to your collaboration with Craig Stoll uh, and bringing those skills that we've been talking about for the last 40 minutes. Uh, to, into the present moment. So, what is this new bread? So, so, and and you know, it's it's uh, you know, as a baker, I'm like, hey, why am I on Pizza Quest? I mean, I love it. I'm so glad to be here. But I'm like, I got to present information and give information that Pizzaiola will also be able to use. And you know, there's the trend with uh, artisan baking being in the same shows with the Pizza Con and all that stuff. But this gave me the opportunity to really explore the the continuum and how on one end you have pizza and the other end you have bread. And it's really just a continuum of 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 bread products, of dough right. products. Right. So. So. Uh, OK, so. So here I go. So. OK, there's the official title. And so we're back at the protocept phase. The Delfina said, you know what? We want a table bread, but we don't want the Ligurian focaccia. We don't want something that's high. It's doughy. It's springy. I mean, it's it's a wonderful product in and of itself. But they said, we want something a little bit different, 
than something that. new and different. Yeah. So we're looking at for those who are not who are listening to the audio version. Uh, Michael and I are now looking. He's sharing some slides of what looks like classic Ligurian focaccia. Uh, as sort of, this is what we don't want to do. We want to use this as a starting point, but not an ending point. Okay, yes. And and you know what? I think this is what in sensory, we call this an anchor. On one end, we have this anchor. And on the other end, we have something else. So we're going to work in the middle there somewhere. Okay. And um, thank you for saying uh, this is for audio, or it could be. Um, the characteristic here is that the, the bread itself is about an inch and a half to two inches high. And the crumb is fairly uniform and the size of the holes is fairly is fairly small. Uh -huh. So it, it, it has a bread-like characteristic in, in a way, like a chewy kind of white breadish kind of thing. I'm doing great disservice to everyone who makes and focaccia but as far as describing it that's where we are with this so right so the yeah. other end of the uh, continuum is okay. the pizza bianca and if you look at this thing this is approximately an inch a third of an inch to a half an inch thick it's very very long and it has a striation in the cell structure that in a way looks like it could be uh puff pastry or something like that. Yeah. Large irregular holes. Large irregular that are spread out horizontally, horizontally yeah. instead of vertically the way the, uh, the focaccia would be. And this, because of its thinness, uh, loses moisture a lot faster. So it tends to be a little bit crispier and uh, kind of crunchier when you eat it, as opposed to the chewiness of the uh, Ligurian focaccia. This, this so, photo so looks to me like something that I had in Rome at the Campo de Fiore, the 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 classic uh, uh, forno. What do they call it? The Antico Forno. Uh, pizza, well, pizza Bianca. You know what, Pete, Peter? There's a real good reason for that because um, that's actually where this is from. And, uh, oh. <laughs> hey, <laughs> did I make the panel? <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good for you. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that's, and, uh, so, so it, those of you who are listening you ha and have ever been to Rome know what Michael's talking about. This, this is a classic, uh, you know, long flatbread. And now he's showing us a photo now of one of these planks of dough. It's probably about six, seven feet long. That's about to go into the oven, right? So this, yes. And this is, this is properly called pizza a la pala, which literally means this is pizza that is loaded into the oven from a shovel. And, <laughs> uh, and the, uh, and so, so I, this actually is a little, a moving video. Oh no, go back, go back and show it. There you go. So you can see how really kind of thin this is, how, yeah. how extensible it is. It looks cetera. like a long, is, a long pizza dough basically with, it, with a nice olive oil topping and written yes. bubbles. And um, it is at this point, it is six feet long and then it's going to be pleated onto a two foot long loading uh, peel. That's the actual uh, pala. And then that is unloaded into the oven. And what happens as it goes in, they, 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 they scoot off about two or three inches of it. They let the deck, the heat of the hearth, grip that dough. And then they kind of coax the dough yeah. out so that it kind ending of shape is about eight feet long. So that's they kind of jiggle it off of the off they of the jiggle uh, it and stretch it. So wow. it has a, a you know a very much a, extensibility to it. And uh, so here's a finished one here, and you can see it. It's this is yeah. This paper. is like this is the full length now. Like you say, seven, seven to eight feet long. Yeah, that looks almost like a giant sheet of matzah, like bubbly matzah in a way. Well, but, you know, and it it comes from that uh, 
comes from that uh, Middle Eastern flatbread type of uh, uh, bread making, leavened and, and unleavened, where, uh, you know, it's just, it, it, it becomes the, you know, it can become the plate that people eat from, or it becomes the scoop that people are, yeah. you know, eating their, their bowls of food with, et cetera. And the cool thing about it is my recollection, because it's been a while since I've been there, uh, but you go into the bakery and there's a long plank of dough. There's a red, there's red and there's white. There's some has some red sauce, some has uh, oil and herbs. And you just hold your hands out to the size of the piece you want. And they just lop off a piece from the plank and weigh it. And they charge you by the gram. And, and it is so good that you, always regret that you didn't ask hold your hands out wider because by the time you get back to your hotel room it's already gone oh maybe maybe you even get that far i don't know yeah, but know. it's it's interesting cuz what you were talking about here is like saying the width of the uh of the slab that you want them to cut across yeah, for you yeah. and um in italian that is called atalia or uh, Alteglio, depending okay, on okay, what yeah. region you're from. And that just means literally by the slice. I and, see. And um, what's the name of that restaurant? It's Triple Bean in L.A. L.A., Nancy Silverman's place, yeah. Yes, that, that you know, they actually have, you know, they have hands on the wall. Like, you go like that, you go yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. you go like that. There's a little arrow. And that, you know, this is what you do. Well, she and did tell us that she modeled that, that, that concept on, on uh, the Campo de Fiore. On Campo, yes. Yeah. Yes, because these guys, I mean, they've been making this since 1846, I think. <laughs> these guys are... These are the, uh, I mean, this is the paradigm. This is one end. This is an anchor on a continuum, you know. Gotcha. And, and, okay. So, this, and, is, so uh, this is a steps along the way to coming to this new product that you've been developing. Yes, yes. So so those were the two things, the, the Ligurian focaccia and then this little, uh, you know, pizza Bianca. Yeah. So, of course, now now we go through the uh, uh, we, we we developed the protocept and that took. Oh, gosh, I think we worked on that for about two months. Different flour blends, different olive oil ratios, et cetera, et cetera. And um this is what uh, this is what we were able to come up with at uh, Delfina. Oh wow! So now we're starting to see uh, photos of the new bread, the actual something in between the two worlds that you uh, that you the anchors that you described. Right, and a, right. And it's a Good. thicker, uh, beautifully bubbly loaf of bread with wonderful caramelization, pockets of olive oil. And um, we're seeing a close-up of it. We're seeing the outside only, but pretty soon I think we're going to see the cross-section. I think you are. And here it is right here. So this is the height of the Ligurian focaccia. It's about an inch and three quarters, an inch and a half, maybe two inches where the, where the bubbles are. But you can see the cell structure is much more... Uh, varied. We have small. We have extra large. It's gorgeous. You can see, it's it's very uh, like very well distributed throughout. It's, so it's, it's kind not, of ciabatta like, wouldn't you say, Michael? That has, it has it looks like the most beautiful ciabatta structure. It 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 has characteristics of a ciabatta. Yes, yes, it does. But when I look at it in cross section, and I have to say, Instagram has really made me uh, crumb sensitive these days because everybody is showing the the crumb shot on their uh, focaccias and on their uh, croissant and their sourdoughs. I see this as a little bit closer to maybe what a croissant mm. could look like mm. in terms of, because there's a lot of olive oil in here and uh, there's, there's basic, I mean, I can't give away the formula. Of yeah, course, yeah. But there mm. is about two and a half to three times more baker's percent of olive oil in this bread than there is in a ciabatta. So, yeah, and, but it's uh, part of what makes it, work functionally for what you're trying to do before we run out of time can you take us through the the, the rest of the slides because i don't want to i don't want to sure. deprive our viewers but now, now there's a really nice uh shot of three 
three levels of this bread. Is it all from the same loaf? Just this is all bread? from that very same loaf right there. That incredible structure. That's that very same loaf. You kind and of like you look at it and you just want to sink your teeth into it. That that's exactly right. Yeah, it's got the the crispy kind of easy bite crust to it and then yeah. the inside really it's like almost like mm, chewing a sponge that's yeah. dipped in olive oil yeah. you know it just yeah. releases as you <laughs> eat and uh you don't have to be a master taster to be already tasting <laughs> these, these these images yeah here it looks like a couple of the bakers getting ready to now do here, some more here's food. what i have to tell you because we you commercialize a product, you know, when I work with, uh, you know, one of the big food companies and they say, all right, that's great. Let's make enough that we can put this on every, uh, you know, supermarket yeah. shelf in America. Yeah. You know, you have machinery that you work with, you know, you have, you have these huge mixers, you have all these things that you can regulate, you can dial in and you can get the consistency that you want. Yeah. When you're working in a ba when you're working in a restaurant, especially, you, you don't have that consistency. I mean, the temperature changes. One day, the temperature is 68. The next day, it's 92. And bread behaves differently. The dough reacts differently. Yeah. There's a lot of, of tweaking you need to do. And then if you look at, I mean, before we were talking about human tasters being machinery, okay, I got two guys here who you can just see by their stature and by their hand width, et cetera, how very different they are. And yeah. so it's a question of how can we make things come out consistently here? Right. And these guys, I have to say this team, I never worked with a team that was more diligent or more fun loving. You know, Absolutely. these yeah. guys were just <laughs> like, okay, did we do it right? And they took such pride in this. So, so for these me, like that was sun. more rewarding than, than any. Yeah. These, these are, I'm just going to go back to them real fast. This is Tio and Manuel. And, and yeah. really, they, the they turned heroes. these things out. They turned these things out. So we came out and we said, okay, you know what? Here we go. We have a bread and we're going to call it Pane a la Pala which means bread off of a shovel. Uh -huh. And it's a whole I mean, new a category. Uh -huh. and so I know that you were kicking around a lot of different names for this. Pane Alapala Pala is the current, uh, is the is the one, the one that you've settled on for the name? I, I, I'll tell you why. You know why? Because I'm one of those guys who will take five or six names. We were talking about calling it Lungo and Cushino because it looks yeah. like a cushion and all that stuff. I put all the names down and I sent it to Massimo Botura, who is who has right now the 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 uh, the best restaurant in the world. And yeah. it's in Modena, it's in Italy, and he is very much classic oriented and interprets things. And I explained it to him, sent him pictures, and I said, What what should I call this? And he said, Oh no, you must call it Pane Pala because everyone knows the pizza Bianca comes off the pala, and now you have pane. So you must yeah. call it that. Pane Pala. Yeah, Pane and Ala Pala. I, I love it. We're, 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 we're coming down to the end. I don't want to lose the last couple okay. slides. So let's, here we go. let's keep there's going. Some more. Like, there's oh, and here we are. side by side. And, and I, of course, the very artisan, very each one is its unique individual thing. Someday in the future, when they figure out how to mass produce this bread, you know, it will all look the same. But right now, enjoy it. And it's we're in the artisan discovery phase of, of a new product. Uh, with a, now this latest slide that you're putting up has shows a close up of the structure, the crumb, the shiny gelatinized uh, uh, internal, you know, cross section of the the loaf, including the gluten threads that are just barely holding it together. The starches are totally shined and gelatinized. I'm just trying to create some words for the people that can't see this. Oh, but you look at it and very you go, good. "That is an Instagram food porn shot." Right, Wait right, exactly. To me, that looks like you know, the best croissant webbing, you know, yes, it's got yes, that, it's yes. got that whole thing to it. And it, there's and something so exciting about it when you see it, that you just want to, can't wait to try it. Okay. Well, they serve it slides now on just the table bread yeah. with, uh, uh, 
uh, more tigella and prosciutto yeah. and some fresh ricotta. So these these the, this charcuterie that's that's in the slide is part of the spread that Craig put out for us when you brought me to the restaurant a couple of weeks ago and we did some tasting. And so we had this bread with all these various cool meats and anchovies and olive oil and cheeses. Um, it was like a feast that I, I think if the restaurant were just serving that alone, it would already be a destination restaurant. <laughs> That was that was my food for the day. I that ate was, that, and I didn't have to eat anything exactly. until dinner time. Maybe I had a bowl of cereal. Well, so. I didn't want to eat anything after eating all that because I, I didn't want to to lose the lingering flavors that were still. Yes. you know, I was enjoying yes. it. So, okay, we're we're coming to the end. We've got only a minute left before we, they're gonna the Zoom's gonna cut us off. Uh, are there any more slides? Oh, here's some. Uh, well, now, now here's, an here's another one. Uh, they're they're uh, just developing now some open face sandwiches to serve okay. at. That's, uh, that's going to that's going to bring in the lines for sure. Yeah, some beautiful meats, and then uh, and then I think there was. Um, that's it. That's, right? it. that's, all, that's all I have. Okay. Well, all let have, yeah. because I, before we get cut off, I want to thank you, Michael, so much for sharing all this knowledge. Uh, we talked about a lot of stuff, but was, I think this idea of the evolution of, of an idea to a product and everything, the anchors and all the, the verbiage and language and articulation, this is all part of the journey. And here on Pizza Quest, we celebrate the quest as much as we celebrate the pizza. And I think that you've shared with us your long 40 year, 40, I don't know how many years it is, at least 40 since I've known you, quest, you know, to become, you know, a, a person who can create some beautiful products. This could be a legacy product for you. I'm so glad you got a chance to work on it. Thank you for, for joining us today and sharing all this. We got to get you back. When Craig said he would come on, when the, the restaurant reopens, maybe we get you and Craig on together and talk about the launch of these new sandwiches and, and this new bread, because it's pretty exciting. Well, thank you, Peter, for those kind words and for giving me the opportunity to share with your viewers my tiny little, my tiny little piece of the pizza quest. Well, congratulations on the on the whole journey and on the most recent chapter in the journey. I look forward to seeing you back in San Francisco. Uh, uh, Brad English, our producer and co-founder, is watching this as we speak, and and I'm sure we're already thinking about how can we get a camera crew back to San Francisco and film, you know, this this new chapter in the life of uh, of you know of what you're doing and with Craig uh, Stoll's doing at. Uh, you know, at, at the pizzeria. So we're looking forward to it all. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us on Pizza Quest today. We'll see you on the next episode. May your, Thank you. May your pizzas all be perfect. Pizza Quest with Peter Reinhardt is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.